Hello, my name is Katie Lonsbury. My presentation today is on the feminist art collective Guerrilla Girls. Here is their story. In 1984, the Museum of Modern Art held an exhibition of the most important contemporary artists. Of the 169 artists featured, only 13 were women. Even less were people of color, and women of color were entirely absent. A group of women staged a protest over these statistics, and soon after, seven of the protesting women got together in New York City and formed the Guerrilla Girls, with the intention of protesting sexism in the art world. One anonymous Guerrilla Girl stated this about the formation of the group. That's why we formed, for the gush of collectors' cash was profiting mostly white male artists. In one of their first meetings held by the Guerrilla Girls, one member unintentionally misspelled the group's name, and the idea for members to wear gorilla masks was born. Remaining anonymous was important to the members, as it kept the attention on their message. Members used pseudonyms derived from dead female artists to remain anonymous, and as an homage to the unrecognized and unappreciated female artists. Membership was invite-only, and over the course of about three decades, the Guerrilla Girls had a little over 100 members. The Guerrilla Girls initially staged protests at museums around New York City and leafleted around the art-centric Soho district, but in 1989, one of their graphic posters became an iconic image of the organization and a good representation of the tactics they used. For this poster, members visited several museums and did a weenie count. They counted the male nudes versus the female nudes, as well as the male artists versus the female artists. These statistics, displayed in the poster, were very telling of the hierarchy in the art world and its views on women. The tactics used by Guerrilla Girls, as said by two of the founding members, were facts, humor, and outrageous visuals. They often employed a simple counting tactic, counting the number of female and non-white artists displayed in the museum. At times, they would be directed to the basement or storage, the only place to find works by female artists. The messages and tactics used by Guerrilla Girls had some similarities to second wave feminism. In fact, the founding members were largely shaped by feminists of the 1970s, and this can be seen by their tendency to focus solely on women's issues during the first few years. This excluded racial discrimination from their focus, and the Guerrilla Girls often found their members of color quickly dropping out of the organization because of the lack of recognition of multiple discriminations. The Guerrilla Girls employed humor as a major tactic, often displaying sarcastic posters to point out discrimination. Second-wave feminists were known for their sober, serious demeanor in public, but they too employed humor and wit as a survival tactic when discussing such hard topics. In 1995, the Guerrilla Girls published their first book, with three more books following in the years after. Their first book consisted of interviews with members about the organization, peppered with humor and illustrations. In the mid-90s, the Guerrilla Girls began focusing on issues outside of the art world, such as homelessness and the war. They also became more inclusive in their art protests, recognizing race and sexuality as discriminating factors, and they made efforts to become a more diverse organization. These efforts are largely attributed to the overall recognition of multiculturalism in mainstream America at this time. In 2000, new, younger members were recruited and brought with them a more technologically savvy approach to their activism. Unfortunately, two of the founding members were reluctant to give up their power and influence in the organization, and their push for tradition and more power drove the group apart. In 2001, the two aforementioned members fired other, more progressive founding members. These ousted members went and formed auxiliary Guerrilla Girl organizations, one called Guerrilla Girls on Tour and the other called Guerrilla Girls Broadband. They had the intention of being more diverse and open to sharing power with new members. In 2003, the two prominent founding members sued the auxiliary groups for rights to the logo, the name, and content. This severely detracted from the work all three organizations were attempting to do. Despite this setback, all three groups were able to move forward somewhat amicably and are still active. Guerrilla Girls on Tour annually protests the Tony Awards and does theatrical performances to raise awareness. Guerrilla Girls Incorporated tours around the world giving lectures and performances and continues to publish posters. Guerrilla Girls Broadband also publishes posters on various issues and is available for bookings at events and schools around the U.S. All three have up-to-date websites with tour dates and links to social media. 
all three guerrilla girl organizations are still actively changing the world for women everywhere.